GEMS, exponential centers dedicated to exploring the people and the companies and the communities in Silicon Valley and beyond that uh, transform the world through tech innovation and entrepreneurship. Often great universities and disruptive companies uh, lead these changes, and certainly that's been core to the story of Silicon Valley. To lead either a world-changing university or a disruptive company is remarkable, but to do both is unique. As a computer scientist, he developed a new technology and founded MIPS, a pioneering company. As president, he led Stanford to new heights. And as board member and now chair at Alphabet um, and Google, he's led a disruptive company. From these experiences, he has captured his insights and stories in what Bill Gates has called, quote, an indispensable guide for leaders at every level. Whether in education, business, government, or education, the need for effective leadership is more pressing than ever. John Hennessy is the uh, chairman of Google's parent company, Alphabet, and former president of Stanford. And as is our tradition, I'd like to introduce him through five numbers. 1977 was the year that John came to Stanford. 100 is the number of the annual night. Hennessy scholars at Stanford, the inaugural class is just starting this week. Um, they are now the largest fully endowed scholarship program in the world addressing global issues. 35 is the ratio of Google revenue in 2017 compared to 2004 when John joined the board. Not bad. <laughs> 99 is the percentage of microprocessors in the world that use RISC um, ideas, fundamental to his work as a computer scientist. And 16 is the number of years as president at Stanford. And here tonight, we're very thrilled to welcome back Marissa Meyer. Uh, to the stage here at the museum to moderate the conversation. After 13 years at Google, she served as uh, CEO and president of Yahoo and spearheaded its acquisition um, by Verizon. She recently returned to her long-standing interest in AI um, by co-founding Lumi Labs in Palo Alto, which is focused on building consumer applications enabled by AI. Let me share five numbers about Marissa. 3,000 is the number of students Stanford, at Stanford that she has taught introductory programming to. 20 was the employee number of her, for her at Google. 1999 was the year she received her MS in computer science from Stanford. Seven, the years listed on Fortune's 50 most powerful women in business. And 43, the number of billions of dollars in shareholder returns during her tenor, tenure at Yahoo. What better people than to welcome these two to talk about leadership. Please join me in giving a very warm CH welcome to John and Marissa. Well, I'm so excited to be here tonight. Uh, the book is called Leading Matters, Lessons from Your Journey. And it's been such an amazing journey, but it's far from over. Uh, and so I wonder, what, I think the question I'd like to open up with, which I know it was shared by members of the audience, is why this book, why now? It's a good question, Marissa. As I was getting ready to step down as president, I started thinking, what do you want to do next? Well, I had a lot of people who wanted me to go on additional corporate boards and do things like that. And I got some really great advice from um, Bill Meehan, the former head of McKinsey on the West Coast. And he said, you're not going to be happy if you're doing a bunch of little things. So that led to what eventually became the Knight Hennessy Scholarship Program and a, a big involvement with a new generation of young people. But then I said, if we're going to help educate young people about leadership, I better figure out what I think matters and what they need to learn and the skills they need to develop and the characteristics, even in picking these uh, extraordinary young people. And that was the beginning of really trying to put my ideas in writing. One great thing about writing is when you write them down, you have to really be crystal clear and think them through. Um, and, you know, of the many different lessons about leadership in the book, one of my favorites is storytelling. Mm. And so I was wondering, trying to combine a few different things here, 
Could you tell us the story of the most pivotal moment in your journey, the most interesting thing you learned about leadership from a pivotal moment? Well, I think probably I, I learned a lesson early on in a startup. When I, when I started a company, I was a bit of a reluctant entrepreneur. Um, I, we, we published our papers on risk and on the MIPS project at Stanford, and I thought, we're done. These are such good ideas that all the computer companies are going to pick them up. <laughs> that didn't work. <laughs> Uh, so we eventually were convinced by, by a famous uh, computer engineer, Gordon Bell, uh, one of the people who had been instrumental in building DEC to start the company. But we didn't really know what we were doing from a business um, perspective. So we went out, got the company started, began to get customers, it grew, um, and it simply hired too many people early on before the revenue really started coming along. So we had to go through a layoff. Small company, 120 people, you've got to lay off a third of the employees. It was, it was torturous. I mean, you, you basically, everybody knows the people being laid off. And then the CEO who says to me, he says, we're going to do the layoffs early Friday morning. Everybody will be gone by noon. And at TGIF on Friday, I want you to get up and talk about how this company is still great and we're going to be successful. I said, thank you. <laughs> uh, but I realized that was the moment you had to rise to the occasion and figuring out, telling the story of why this company could really change the computer industry and could have dramatic impact, that was a good lesson for me at that time. And then later on, you run into disasters all the time. Certainly in startups, you run even large institutions, the financial crisis which set the university back. Um, I drew from that later to help me figure out how to guide things through. Another one of the traits you talk a lot about is humility mm. in leadership. And obviously, one of the biggest ways that humility is learned is through mistakes and failures. Uh, what has been some of your biggest mistakes and failures? And what have you learned from them? <laughs> Starting a company without knowing anything about how companies are financed. or If you had asked me when I started the company what fraction of the revenue should go to engineering, I would have said, well, at least half. I mean. Uh, <laughs> And I, and I sort of, well, you don't need salespeople because great products sell themselves. And uh, so that was a real, that was, I, I made a bunch of mistakes there, I think. Uh, but I learned them the next time around. The next startup, I, I understood a lot more and I could, and I could advise students much better uh, in that process. You know, we, we um, I'm a big believer in trying things that are really bold. And you look at Stanford's history the university has been made by people who did big things. I mean, building a linear accelerator in the foothills in the 19, starting in the 60s, but in the 1970s, at a time, who would have thought of doing that? And yet, you know, six or seven Nobel Prizes later, it looked like a really good investment <laughs> in the future. So try bold things. Um, we had this opportunity, an invitation from the mayor of New York, who was then Bloomberg, uh, to think about building a campus in New York City on Roosevelt Island in some old space, an old hospital that was being shut down. I thought it was a tremendous opportunity to think about the future of universities and whether or not a university could be in two physically separate locations. And two great two great centers in the United States, right? The Valley here and New York City, right? The center of finance and fashion and media. So I said, well, let's try this. And I got all the, f it took a long time to get the faculty organized about the idea. And they had some, f they were supportive, but they had some fairly strong guidelines that we had to adhere to. So I knew that we needed to achieve those. When it came time to go into the final negotiation process with New York, the city wanted things that we couldn't guarantee without violating those guidelines. So I was in this position where if, if we pursued it further, I would really have to lose faith with my faculty and break their trust. And so I concluded I, I couldn't do it. And you know, we invested a lot of money, it was a lot of effort, but sometimes these things don't work out and you've got to kind of pull back and reorient yourself and change direction. And on that note, there are lots of business theories and also theories about how to run institutions that become really popular and then fizzle out. What are some of the lessons you've learned that you feel really stand the test of time in terms of how, like leadership and how to build a strong institution or a strong company? Well, I think one thing that really stands the test of time is some notion of, of 
authenticity and trust. I mean, if you think about, think about your experience at Google, um, for Google, the trust, the fact that users trust its search and that it's not going to buy a search and that it's going to give the right result is absolutely crucial to the future of that company. And from the beginning, saying that we're going to give you the search results in what we think is the best order, not what necessarily reflects what some advertisers paid us, has been absolutely crucial to building that commitment. Often, I think people, especially when they start in leadership positions, don't like to be honest with people, particularly about difficult circumstances. None of us, none of us likes to tell somebody who's working for us, you're, you messed up, you're not, gonna, you're not gonna be successful, you need to change how you're doing things. No one likes to deliver those, at least I don't know many people like to deliver those messages. Um, and so learning how to do that and learning how you, and if you don't do it, you come to realize that you could have intervened. You could have coached that person to, into a successful situation. And by failing to do it, you actually contributed to their failure by, by not reversing the situation. And that's a hard lesson to learn, I think. You talk a lot about the different leaders who've influenced you. Mm. Abraham Lincoln, Benjamin Franklin, Steve Jobs. Uh, who are some of the contemporary leaders and rising stars that you feel are poised to fill that leadership role for the next generation? Well, Marissa Meyer. I mean, I think, I, I, think I, love, I love that we have a new generation of women technology leaders who really are experts in computer science. And when she says that she taught that many students, she did teach that many students, and she's a hero to those students. I mean, I, I'm just delighted to see, finally, the rise of more women in computer science in our field. I mean, this is just delightful. It's taken a long time to build, but you were one of the early ones as things really began to change, and I, I think that's terrific. Um, you know, I admire, I admire what, how Bill Gates has reinvented himself as a, as a philanthropist, a great philanthropist. I think that's a really terrific way to First, he's a great entrepreneur, and then he turns around and becomes a great philanthropist. Um, I think lots of young entrepreneurs are just learning how to do this. Um, you know, the one thing that scares me a little bit about the Valley is I hear too many young people talk about how they're going to become a billionaire before they're 35, as opposed to how I'm going to build a great company that delivers great value to its users and its customers. The latter makes a lot of sense. The former is really scary. Absolutely. Do you think that entrepreneurship can be taught? You talk about how entrepreneurs learn. Is it something that can be taught? How is it best learned? Well, I think you can certainly teach some of the skills that are critical, um, how businesses make decision. When I, when I came back to Stanford and, and started doing some things in the engineering school, I realized that we had lots of young people who wanted to be entrepreneurs. We should build an educational program that helps them understand how to talk to a venture capitalist, how their company is going to be evaluated, how to put together a business plan, how to read a balance sheet. It's not rocket science. If you can do computer science, you can read a balance sheet easily, right? <laughs> so just, it's just terminology and vocabulary. So uh, Jim Gibbons had begun before that the, what became the Stanford Technology Ventures Program, but we really tried to expand that to serve our students. It doesn't teach them everything. There's an experiential component. You do have to actually go do it. Um, I think everybody who wants to lead a company should go do cold sales calls one time because there's probably nothing harder than doing cold sales calls. But it builds, your, it builds your confidence. It builds your ability to interact with customers. Um, and I, those are lessons that are more experiential than things you're going to get in a book. But you can combine the two and make people successful. For developing leaders, when they're learning some of these core elements of leadership that you've identified, which one is the hardest to achieve? I think the notion of leadership as service is, is hard to achieve. If you're leading a major company, people stand there and, and by the door, ready to hold the door and open the door for you. They, they put you in a position, they try to surround you with people, they give you a lot of power. 
um, a lot of opportunity. But I think it's very easy to forget that in that role, you serve a, a multi uh, a spectrum, multiple people, multiple different constituencies. You serve, you certainly serve the customers, you serve the shareholders if it's a public company or even a private company, the investors. You serve the employees. You serve the community in which you exist. All those things, and I think it's easy to somehow forget that. Um, leadership is, is, leadership is service. It's service to all those constituencies. And service over a, a, a period of time, so you're not just thinking about well, I'm gonna do this job for six months or the next year and then I'll be out so I don't need to worry about the long-term future of the, of the institution or organization you're leading. Thinking long-term, and, and I think we've lost this, perhaps because if you read a lot of the business books, the focus is on shareholder value, shareholder value, shareholder value, and of course the activist community is, pushes that even harder. Um, shareholder value, yes, but not next quarter. Shareholder value five years from now, that's because that's what I want investors to think about. I want them to think about the company that they're investing in for five or 10 years, not just, not just tomorrow. And that pushes you to think rather differently because when you start saying five years matters, well, then you better make sure you're treating your customers and your users well. You better make sure your employees are really committed to the company because otherwise if they walk out the door, you're not gonna have a company five years from now. And I think we need, to, we need to focus on that more. And certainly in government, we need to focus on it. You know, I, I, had, one, I had a Stanford alum who's in, in Washington say to me, when he went to Washington, D.C., he went there to represent not only his state, but the entire population of the United States and try to do what was best for them. He said, and not just the people who voted for me. And I think we need more of that ethos in our leadership. Absolutely. I think it's, it's hard to change the world in 90 days. It right? is hard so, to change the world um, in 90 days, exactly. But um, one thing that you've seen, you've seen so many different models of leadership. Uh, I, one question that comes up is one of co-leadership. You know, when you have multiple strong leaders in, an, in a company, is that something that ultimately makes it stronger? Does it offer more stability? You know, is it more accountable if you have a single leader? What's your perspective? I think, for, well, leadership is a partnership, and certainly my experience, uh, for 16 years as Stanford's president, and I had the same provost for all 16 years. I was remarkably blessed. I had John Etchemendy, who's probably one of the great provosts, not only in Stanford history, but globally among universities. That's extremely unusual, because provosts, with his ability, get a lot of other presidential offers and decide they want to do that instead. Um, but it, so yes, I guess in the, final, in the final case, if there were a decision to be made, I would be the final decision maker. But that very rarely happens. We worked in a partnership and he would often make decisions and I knew he was gonna, but we keep each other informed and we work together. So it's sort of a CEO, COO model. Um, that's certainly what Facebook is doing now with, with uh, Cheryl and Mark, and I think that model, that model works. Um, we had an interesting experience at, uh, at Atheros. Um, we had gotten to the point where we thought, you know, the current CEO had built the company, had done a great job, but it, we needed to get a new person in. Um, and several board members felt we needed to do it quickly and we should start a search. And I was nervous that when we started that search, it was gonna take a long time to find somebody. And then the paralysis that would exist because nobody would be making decisions. And a funny thing happened. So we created an office of the president. We had like three or four people making decisions. And a funny thing happened. The company actually started making decisions better and faster. Now you'd say, why? That makes no sense. Well, it turned out that the CEO who we had decided to replace was not making the kind of decisions that were really crucial as quickly as they should be made. And so we're doing this search. We can't find the right person. Then the three of the people on that team, that office of the president team, come to us and say, you know, we have the right person. It's number four on this team, and that's the person who should be CEO. And we did it, and 
it turned out it was exactly the right decision and it worked out well. So normally I'm very nervous about two heads, two in a box, but in some cases it can work. Uh, one of the things that sort of comes to mind as you talk about that is a, cr a good crisis is a terrible thing to waste. Absolutely. And one of the things you talk about in the book is necessary risks. So um, what role does risk play in a leadership journey? Well, I think if you, if you become very risk aversive, then you're never going to do anything very big. Um, and I'm, I'm, when I was put in the role as president, I think everybody knew that I wasn't going to be the storekeeper model of president. I was going to try new things and try to move the university in different ways. And I think that's the way I feel about companies, too. And if you've been in a startup environment, certainly you're doing that from the beginning. So risk is part of it. The great thing about the Valley is you can fail in the Valley and, and come back, provided you were seen as taking a smart risk. And there are stupid risks in life. Um, those you should avoid. I, I, I walk around campus and I tell all those students without bicycle helmets, there are stupid risks in life and you're showing one right now. <laughs> so, but I think, I think you've got to be willing to embrace risk. If you become so risk adversive, you're condemning yourself to lots of little things. You, from your vantage point, gotten to see so many different types of leadership models and what works. Now focusing in on Silicon Valley, does Silicon Valley need its own type of leadership? You know, do you think there are things that are universal? Are there particular flavors that seem to work better in technology or in Silicon Valley particularly? Well, I think since the Valley is so steeped in innovation, that's become a key aspect of it. Um, clearly, our companies have become even more technically edgy than they ever were. And I think that's changing the new generation of leadership is more technical than it was in an, in an earlier era where you had people coming through other routes, right? Uh, sales and marketing or other things. But I think we're in a, we're in a different era. You know, when I, when I started here in the Valley, um, we built products for other tech users and products for the business community largely. Now we build products that touch virtually everybody's life every single day and impact it in important ways. That requires a different vision of the role of the company than just being this little tech company, I, I build X. And I, I think we've really seen that uh, come to fruition recently. Uh, and it's going to require a more thoughtful kind of, and some difficult wrestling with issues. I mean, just think about the issue of, uh, we're, we're a country that believes in the First Amendment quite strongly. Well, if you believe in the First Amendment, then I guarantee People are going to publish things that you think are erroneous, that are hate speech, that are all kinds of things. And that's going to be a really difficult thing to grapple with. Um, so we've got hard problems, I think, ahead of us uh, as, we've, as we've become technology. The internet is the publication vehicle for the world now. I was at a dinner last night and we started talking about some of the employee activism oh, yeah. that's out there, uh, which I think in many ways is so inspiring and really forces institutions to take a hard look at what they're doing and, and, and how they're conducting themselves. You know, what, are you, what do you think is the right recipe for leadership in the face of employee activism sometimes, which is really well-founded, sometimes which is you know, maybe off, off base from where the company wants to be? What's the right way for a leader to handle that? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, one of the great uh, advantages of being in a university is there, nothing is secret. Everything's <laughs> out there. And, and your largest population, your students, they make employees look like calm, sedate people. Because <laughs> <laughs> the students are they're passionate about, about changing the world. Um, and they often approach it with a lack of knowledge or naivete, but they're passionate about doing the right thing. Um, I think, you know, as you know from, from your time at Google, um, getting the employees really knowledgeable about the company and where it's going and what it's thinking about and how it's wrestling with problems really empowers them and makes them committed to the, to the mission. Um, when that activism then goes beyond the bounds of the company and leaks out of the company, um, thereby harming the country, uh, harming the company, or disclosing information that wasn't ready for public consumption, then that's going to be damaging. How you balance those things—that's, I think, what has to be figured out. 
another one of the hot topics of the day is obviously gender. Yes. Uh, what type of role does gender play in some of your leadership recommendations and insights? Does, does a different model work for women leaders than for, for male leaders? It, you know, it may. I mean, I think, I think um, so first of all, thankfully there is a dying breed of men who are uncomfortable with strong women. But for many years, that was a real problem. And you would see this in, in interviews where people would be interviewing people and the comments on the, on the woman applicant would come back, she's too aggressive. She's, have you ever seen this written about a male? He's too aggressive in his, in, in his planning and how he's gonna take the company forward. They didn't do it. Now that, that breed of people who think that way, I think is vanishing over time. That's a healthy thing. Um, but figuring out how we make women successful, I'm watching what happened in computer science, which was really the women building a support cohort when they were not in critical mass so that they could get themselves to critical mass and really make a change. And that was really empowering. And I think we need to think about how do we do that and how do we educate young people. Um, what I find amazing, so we have this new class of Knight Hennessy scholars coming in and it's majority women. And these women are really incredible. What they've accomplished already is incredible. They're gonna change the world. And if we as a society hold them back because of gender, we're gonna be a worse world for that. So we've gotta got think differently about that. And how do we prepare them to be the next president or something important like that? <laughs> Um, one of the things that they do here as part of the Exponential Series is have one word that embodies leadership uh, and advice. Uh, and so, what is your one word? My and one word is innovate. <laughs> innovate. And I, and this is, um, so one of the things that happens when you're in a university and you've, you've been successful as an entrepreneur, is you have a stream of students coming into your office and they all say, I want to become an entrepreneur. And then I say, tell me about your discovery or your technology. I don't have one yet, but I want to be an entrepreneur. <laughs> so I said, go innovate first. Great companies are built around great discoveries, great inventions, um, great new technologies. Find that first. And then I proceed to tell them, I ask them a question. How many photo sharing companies got funding from the venture community broadly across the entire United States? Oh, I don't know. They say, well, there's Instagram and maybe one or two others, you know, yeah. Picasso. I mean, I said, no, there were more than 100. And you know two of them, right? So you've got to think about innovation. You've got to think about how you do that. And I think that's always been my mindset when I was running the university. I mean, universities, it's very easy for universities to get trapped in the past. After all, they are the preservers of past knowledge and learning. But if they don't go forward, if every day isn't a new first day thinking about what you could do next, then, then they'll be condemned to be um, like, museums that don't do new things, or places that are just old and contain that information. That's, there's a role for that, but that's not the future. Uh, innovation's a great jump off point to Alphabet and Google. Uh, and I thought I would offer a story um, in terms of John's involvement uh, at Google. Uh, today obviously was the Eventbrite IPO, and that always takes me back to the day of, of Google's IPO. And I remember the morning of Google's IPO, it was August uh, 2004. We were there for the ringing of the bell or the opening of the market at, at NASDAQ. Uh, we were back, you know, sort of backstage in their little holding area. And we knew at that time we had to add board members. And so there had been this whole recruiting effort to add board members, but we didn't really know who people had gotten. And so, you know, that day, Larry and Eric were like, this, we added this person, we added this person, we added this person. And I remember, and then they were like, and we got John Hennessy. <laughs> <laughs> and I really, it was really pretty amazing, because obviously Google had been this amazing story, but in, given that we were on the juggernaut, the fact that you joined the board, they were like, we really made it, like Google's gonna be something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, it was, so it was really, it was really wonderful what you've done for the company. And 
the role on the board for all this time, I guess now almost more than 14 years. Yeah, it's been great. It's been great. And I mean, now it's, it's a company that has such great values around innovation and driving itself and excellence, excellence, a kind of core value. And now you get to be there as chairman. So uh, talk a little bit about leadership at Alphabet. What is the current leadership challenge that you're facing? Well, I think we're all facing this big question of how does, I mean, look how quickly tech has gone from the darling of the world to getting blamed for everything. Mm -hmm. Neither one of these was right. It was not the entire darling of the world, nor is it to blame for lots of the things that simply get amplified by the way in which anybody can publish things and put them out on the net now. I think for us, we, we worry a lot about innovation and keeping that innovation cycle going and figuring out what the next bold thing. I remember the discussion on the board when they decided to buy YouTube and it seemed like you were gonna pay more than a billion dollars for a company that hosts videos that people make at home. Of cats. That, you know, <laughs> that cats, of cats, of um, I, I was in does the it meeting. Blend? Was... Does, if you've never seen the does it blend videos, go watch them. A bunch of guys drop things in blenders and crunch them up, including iPhones and everything you can imagine. I was outside that board meeting. There was a lot of discussion of cats and blenders. Yeah, cats and all this. And, and nobody pays anything. Well, so I still remember, I still remember a conversation we had where the remark was made that video is to the next generation what email and text was to your generation. And boom, that was it. So you could immediately, but those kind of, doing those kinds of innovative things, that's what's gonna keep the company growing and healthy and looking at new things. So I think we think a lot about that. And clearly the restructuring of Alphabet was to try to think about a problem that's plagued, I think, every successful startup company, which is how do you do new things and keep them out of the budget battle for enhancements to the existing product. You have to do both somehow, but putting a little fence between them helps protect those new things as they develop. That brings me to my next question, which is Google for a long time was notoriously flat. Yes. In its overall hierarchy. Yes. When should a company be flat and when does a little structure or a little bit of hierarchy help? So flat works up to a given size and then I think things just become too complicated, too, um, require too many decision levels if you flatten it out, and you can't have a meeting. If, you, if it's really flat, you have to have a meeting with 35 people at it. Meetings with 35 people don't reach conclusions. Um, the, so you need to think about a different way to organize that hierarchy without impeding the information going up and down the hierarchy. That, that's what's really uh, crucial. But I, when you start to get 10, 20, 30,000 employees, if you don't have a hierarchy and a way to subdivide responsibility, you're, you're not going to be able to move. Uh, I want to transition now to, uh, to, well, actually, I'm going to transition from Alphabet to Stanford, because it's interesting that you've been involved in one of the biggest commercial successes in the world, Alphabet, and also one of the world's great nonprofit institutions. How does leadership change and what is it like when you're comparing and contrasting those two entities and what it feels like to lead them? Well, I think they both, they both have some common things. Um, you know, Eric, somebody once asked Eric Schmidt um, how he thinks about running Google when he was the CEO and he says, I think about running it the same way Stanford has run. And what he meant by that isn't necessarily some of the chaos that goes on in a university, uh, but what I think he meant was focus on two things, innovation and excellence. And those are two uh, core values that, the, that both Alphabet and the university share. What's different? Well, look at the rate of growth. Uh, in the time I was president of Stanford for 16 years, the budget grew by about a factor of three and the headcount grew by about a factor of two over that time. In 14 years on the Google board, the budget's grown by 35 times and the headcount has grown by 30. Um, Google's quarterly revenues are equal to Stanford's entire endowment built over 125 years, and it's 20 years old. <laughs> I mean, the pace of change, the way at which innovation goes, and I think this is going to create an interesting time in our industry because some of the interesting research problems 
have to be tackled in the context of these large companies. Um, they have the data and they have the computational capability. And so we have to rethink the relationship between our universities and how they're going to work with companies if they're going to continue to be important contributors to pushing this technology forward. Continuing on that notion of universities and Stanford in, in particular, um, I'm guessing there's many entrepreneurs and engineers in the room, but probably no other university presidents. So you've talked a little bit about what it's like to lead a university, but tell us a little bit about what a day in the life of a university president is like from you know, first thing in the morning to last thing at night. Yeah. Um, so I get up early in the morning, usually between 5.15 and 5.30. I never set an alarm. I haven't had to set one for the last 20 years, um, except when I'm jet lagged, except if I'm flying around the world. But otherwise, I don't. Um, so I get up. Uh, I make a latte first thing. Uh, l l listen to the news on, on my Google speaker. Um, and then generally make a quick pass over email and the news just to see what crises. And then I, I found that I needed to get much more um, focused on getting exercise in. That you get a lot of stress in these jobs. Any of these leadership jobs are very stressful. It's very easy to not worry about your health and your wellness and things like that. So I became, re and, I, and I had to put it in my calendar and stick to it. Because otherwise, it's very easy to go start reading your email get tangled up in something, then you turn around and it's time to get ready for your first appointment and you didn't get your exercise. So I became really religious about that. Then my days would vary a lot. Um, if I'm a person who, if I'm getting ready for a big presentation, for example, or I have to write something, um, I lock the morning down and I take the morning to do that because I really find having at least two hours of really focused time forces me to, to really get it done. Um, but then I'd have a range of appointments, and they could be people from you know, low Stanford people, my, my own team that was working with me. Um, I did a lot of management by walking around. One of the great things about being president of the university is you, you become curious about any research that anybody's doing. You call them up and you say, I'd like to come over and visit your lab and see what you're doing. They love it. They love it. They're very happy to show you what they're doing and, and what's going on. And often, that gives you insights. And you say, wow, that's really great stuff. We ought to take some of our little presidential money and put it behind that research, because it's really groundbreaking. So we, I did a lot of that while I was president. And I did one other thing I, I did. I, um, I made a decision early on that I needed to stay in contact with the faculty. So I scheduled groups of lunches with about 15 faculty with every single faculty member in the university. And I'd start that. I'd work through the year. It took me about four years to get through the entire university. And then it's like painting the Golden Gate Bridge. After you get to one end, you go back and go the other direction. And I did that uh, during my entire 16 years as president. And it was really wonderful. I really got to understand what they were working on, what they were worried about, how they saw things emerging. It was a terrific way to do things. What were, some, were there any key insights that stand out, like lunches where you're like, wait, this faculty member said something to me, and it really changed something that you did? Yeah, so one of the things I heard, I heard um, early on when I started doing this were some of the challenges that some of our young faculty were having. Uh, and it seemed to me um, that in many cases, um, faculty members who were minorities or women were seeming to report more challenges than the men were reporting in these. And that got me thinking about cultural issues and what kind of support we were creating for people, how we were helping them balance their work life and their career. It's, being an assistant professor is an extremely demanding uh, time commitment. Um, how could we help make them more successful? Because I, I, I believe if we as a society don't figure out how we can have people be in leadership positions and maintain work-life balance, we're going to suffer. We're going to lose lots of great people who decide they can't stay committed to their careers. You talked a little bit about life hacks, uh, things that can help achieve balance, also lattes, two hours of yeah. focus time. Do you have any other life hacks that you find just make you that much more effective or overall are, are words of advice? Uh, uh, so I'm a voracious reader, and I have been for many years. I read a lot, and that's the every 
I finish the day always with reading. Well, sometimes I half finish the day by falling asleep in front of the TV first. Uh, but then I always get back to try to read something. So I'm a voracious reader. Um, and I've always had the view that if I can learn something by reading it, that's a whole lot easier than having to learn it by going out and doing it myself and learning from, uh, learning from other people's mistakes and experiences is more valuable. So that's been something I've always um, been passionate about. Uh, I'm going to ask you, what, what was your best day uh, as town for president? And then also, what was your worst day? So you can take yeah. them in either order. <laughs> so my best day, my best day, we um, made a decision to um, make a major enhancement to financial aid um, because we discovered that many students, um, particularly from lower income families, were not applying to the university. They'd simply look at the sticker price and they'd say, I can't even bother applying. So we decided we needed to restructure that, put more money into it, but also make a very simple message. Um, because these were, these were kids who were coming from families or, or schools that were under-resourced. They didn't have a guidance counselor, a, a separate college prep counselor. Um, so we made a simple decision. Your family makes less than $100,000, your tuition at Stanford will be zero. The, um, and, and I was really, yeah, it was, it was a good thing, and that simple message was key. That's the thing of all the things I've done that the alumni thought was the best. And I got letters after letters, bravo, this is a great thing, which is amazing because it wasn't Stanford alumni whose children were going to benefit from that. Most of them were doing quite a bit better than that. But this notion, this American dream that you were going to ensure that somebody who was highly qualified could go to a place like Stanford, independent of their family background, people just, that's a, that's a kind of American dream and I think something we need to preserve. So that was my best day. My worst day. Oh, well, students had a, a hunger strike over some things in labor conditions. Um, that was really hard. That was really hard. Uh, students are the lifeblood of the university. They're the ones you're serving. They're the ones you're working with. Uh, they, they had the right, some right notions, but some wrong ways to solve the problem. And um, it, was, it was really hard finding a way through that without letting students really get injured in some way or without compromising some other um, uh, principal in the university. That was tough. The Knight Hennessy Fellowship is such a big idea. And I think some people in the room may or may not be familiar with it. Um, but why don't you talk a little bit about it? So our idea was to, um, I, I began to be dismayed about the quality of leadership. This is before any recent elections or before. The, but if you just go back in history, I mean, we did have the financial aid crisis. Let's say we didn't, we didn't on everywhere, we didn't have the best leadership we could have had, or we, that problem probably would have been much less than it turned out to be. Um, but the growing partisanship we saw in Washington, even five or six years ago, it was growing. You know, Europe was struggling with issues. And I said, let's, and then I started looking at other programs. I mean, obviously the Rhodes Scholarship Program, which had come many years earlier. Um, and we said, why don't we try to build a program inspired by that, but with our own unique characteristics. It's here in the Valley, it's at Stanford, it's at a place that believes in innovation and entrepreneurship. Uh, it's a place that sits on the Pacific Rim. Um, and let's make it global so we get the best students from around the world. Um, we have one young man coming from Tajikistan who's going to be a, who's going to be a Knight Hennessy scholar. Um, we have a young woman coming from India who's already built a foundation that was selected by Prince Harry and Meghan Markle as one of the eight foundations that they'd like wedding gifts to go to. I mean, these are young people who are so accomplished. And you see them. And I, optimism just pours out of my bones at that point. I just think that's the future. If we can help get them a graduate education, and prepare them for a leadership role, whether in the corporate world, in the academic world, or in government, um, we'll build a better world that way. I was just telling you before that I wrote a recommendation for a fellow for next year. And I do think it's really amazing to see how inspiring these young people are. Um, what is your vision for where the Knight Hennessy Fellowship can go in 
10 years? So in 10 years, I will have built up a, a string of, of individuals. We are very much trying to build a community, a community that not only will work together during their time, their students, but will bond and will continue those relationships. So think of it as a network that you could continue to pull on uh, long after you've graduated. I, I think in, in 10 years, we certainly hope that some of these people are doing things that are having impact in the world. But as I've told them, if you look at the amount of time it takes from, for somebody to go from finishing college to really a major a position in the world where they, they can really influence things, that takes a while. So we're very patient. We're trying to pick good people. We're trying to prepare them well, um, and then launch them out on their journey. And I think an interesting thing is going to happen. They're going to hold each other accountable. And they're already talking about what do, we, what do we owe each other as being part of this program? And that's a very different way to think about personal responsibility. And looking out even further, if you looked out 100 years, uh, what would be your hope in terms of the legacy of the program? And First woman president in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully it won't take 100 years. Yeah, I, I, hope so too. I hope so. That's in the 20-year time frame. That's in the 20-year time frame. Uh, I, I, you know, I think... Um, we, we simply are dying for better leadership in, in all walks of life. I mean, if you think about some of the things that have happened in, in recent times, they're not things we should, they're fundamental failures of leadership, fundamental ones. So there's not only the downside to be reduced, but there's the upside to be pushed forward too. Um, people who will have a different view of how they're going to solve problems, how they're going to be leaders, and what they might do, uh, what they might do in the future. So we, uh, we hope that we can make a small contribution uh, to that process, and that we'll get some people who do some great things. I think that would be amazing. Yeah. If you, if you look, at, you know, looking at that hundred-year time frame, how do you think university education will change? Mm. What will the universities look like? Will they still have campuses? You talked about the difficulty of even getting <coughs> Stanford to be, you know, in two places. <coughs> how, how does how does university education change? So there are some things that have to change about university education. I, I, I think the undergraduate four-year residential experience will still be the gold standard. But perhaps not everybody will be able to get that gold standard. We'll have to find a way also to reduce the cost of that gold standard. I mean, if you look at what's happening to, to the UC system, um, you know, we, that, that system is endangered by the fact that we're not able as a state to commit the kind of resources that we need to keep it um, really at the top of its game. And if we destroy one of the great, the great public education system, higher education system in the country, we'll, we'll live to regret it. We'll live to regret it in this country. So we've got to figure out ways in which we um, help our government understand the importance of education. But we in higher education also have a role to play. We've got to figure out how we're going to tame our cost growth somehow. And we haven't been really good about doing that. Uh, some of it's built into the mentorship method and the way we do education, but some of it is a reluctance to use technology in appropriate ways. And finding a way in which you can use technology to reduce costs without reducing the learning experience that students have, and that's crucial because I don't want to make education cheaper and make it inferior. I want to have it be just as good and figure out how to, or even, or even better. And I think that's possible to do if you use technology in appropriate ways. Technology and time change the nature of a university, but they also change the nature of leadership. So looking ahead, what are some of the ways that future leaders are likely to be disadvantaged by technology, and what's the right way to think about that? Well, I think certainly the rise of social media has changed the way every leader needs to think about it. It's, it's, you no longer can just think, well, that doesn't matter. That's because it shapes opinion. It shapes the world. It shapes the vision of companies. Um, it shapes how your employees are thinking. So that, that's really changed things. It's um, meant the cycle is even more 24-7 than it used to be. Um, and that's causing leaders to have to change how they approach things, how they communicate with employees, how they communicate with their customers. Um, 
I don't know that it's necessarily worse. It's just different. It's different and it's more on than it ever was uh, before. And maybe the more on is, is a downside because often some of the behavior that occurs is purely um, reflex. It's not thoughtful in some ways. Um, but that's, that's part of the change that's occurred, and we're going to have to figure out how to navigate our way through it. Uh, talk a little bit about what you're spending your time on now as we're talking about the future. Where, where are you spending your time? I'm, so I'm spending, I'm spending most of my time trying to get ready for 51 really bright people to arrive on <laughs> campus and, and get going in the program. Figuring out what we want to teach them, what skills are most important in their education. Um, I'm uh, back to teaching, actually, my, one of my great loves. And one of the things I probably missed the most when I was president, I just couldn't. I could teach from time to time, but not very much. And I'll be back to teaching both a freshman seminar as well as an uh, advanced architecture course. So I'm excited about, about getting back to doing that. And that'll be a different thing what, for me. What are the course numbers, dare I ask? So uh, <laughs> the, the, the freshman <laughs> seminar is CS 106 something letter. Um, and it, so we teach this course um, called the Intellectual uh, Great Discoveries and Inventions in Computer Science. And we do everything from you know, undecidability to algorithmic complexity to how does hardware work to cryptography. Um, the highlight, what do the students love the most? They love the weekend trip to the Computer History Museum. <laughs> <laughs> they love it. They love it. And, and as I remind them, that's the only place they can see the computers that I learned to program on. <laughs> So it's a great, it, it, they just, they have a great time and we go down and look at, and they're just astonished. I mean, young people, think about how, think about how young they were when they started using computer. You say to them, well, that doesn't even have a hard disk in. They don't have any idea what a hard disk is. So one of the things I do is day one, we come in, I have a bunch of hard, everybody's had hard disk crash failures. I have a bunch of hard disks. We pull it out, we look what's inside, we look at a wafer, we look at, really getting them to understand what's going on in the technology. It's a, it's a wonderful course to teach, just great. I'm gonna transition now to some of the questions from the audience. Uh, building on the Knight Hennessy Scholars, uh, this person asks, as a mentor, what are you looking for in a mentee? Or what are you looking for in the scholars that you're bringing into the program? So we, we in picking our scholars, we tried to look for people who were they were all academically accomplished because our, our scholars have to be admitted by whatever department they're in. So you've got to be admitted to the medical school or the business school or the law school or engineering. So that sets a fairly high bar for their basic academic capability. Then we're looking for other characteristics, independence of thought, people who are creative thinkers who are willing to hold a contrarian viewpoint. Um, people who are, have a, well, we have this humble and kind, that's kind of our motto. We're looking for people who really think about their journey in the world, their success, but also the people they'll bring along and benefit by whatever journey they take. So they see themselves, they see their success aligned with the success of others. And, and we look for people that have that in mind and have that kind of drive and focus. We look for grit. Um, leadership is challenging in all these roles. Um, tell us about the difficult uh, situations you, you overcame. We have one question in the application. Uh, tell us eight improbable facts about yourself. So we have one young woman coming in who says, I can jump over the head of the average American woman. <laughs> and she can, she's a high jumper. She can do that, right? <laughs> she's coming to do medicine. And she's passionate about access and inequities in the way in which we deliver medicine in our country and around the world. I'm sure you've been asked this, and I won't ask you for eight, but what's an improbable fact about you? An improbable <laughs> fact about me, I failed handwriting when I was in elementary school. <laughs> <laughs> and my wife says, you still fail it today. <laughs> The next question builds on the theme of kindness. Uh, social media has raised the immediate need for schools to produce more kindness and more inclusiveness. Mm -hmm. What do you think needs to change in education to foster these human qualities in greater proportion? 
I, I think, um, so one of, the, one of the quotes I use in, in, in the book is a quote from To Kill a Mockingbird, where uh, Finch is saying, you really don't understand a person until you've walked a mile in their shoes. And I think part of what's happened in social media is that people will say things to people in social media or in yik yak, thank God it's gone away. I mean, in, in situations like this, they would never sit across the room from somebody who they had met and been introduced to and say that same thing to them. I think we've got to break down in role models. I mean, I was taught you don't call people nasty names. End of discussion. You don't do it. We, we need people who don't do that. Um, and we need that kind of role model in our young people. We need to model it. And we need to have it, we need to have people appreciate the fact that people come through journeys in different lives. They come from different backgrounds. You know, one of, one of the experiences that really shaped me at one point, I was in India visiting alumni in India. And w one of our alumni said, um, would you like to come along and see the community work we're doing? in the slum that's right near our factory. And I said, yes. And I, I met these. They were educating young girls. Um, and they were teaching them English. Because if they learned English, they could get a job in a hotel or as working in an airline or some other place. And I met these two young girls, cute as buttons. And they said, well, would you like to come back to our house and meet our parents? And I went back and met them. And they, they had a family of three that lived in about 75 square feet of space. They kept it immaculate. Everything was put in its place. And you know, there are very small belongings there. And the, young man, the, the father spoke Urdu, so uh, somebody was with him was translating. And he said, I want to work hard because I want my daughters to have a better life than I've had. And you realize this is universal. It's what all parents want for their children. So the fact that they live a life of poverty and we in the West live a life of privilege, um, don't we owe an obligation to them to try to see that we build a better world for their kids as well as our own? Absolutely. Um, going back to the theme of entrepreneurship, uh, Ray Kunita asks, Entrepreneurs have so many demands on their time. How do we encourage young leaders to think about civic responsibilities and inspire actions for the common good? Yeah. I know Ray for many years. It's a good question. Uh, I, I think we need to, people need to think about their careers in phases. Um, you know, when you're a young entrepreneur or you're a young faculty member in a university, you may not, you may have a hard time balancing your life. Um, but over time, things can evolve, and you can, do, and you can do different things. You know, when we were talking about this program, my, uh, the Knight-Hennessy program, I said, to, I said to Phil Knight, I said, look, we want to produce leaders in all walks of life, but we want to produce people who are going to leave the world better. And if we happen to get a young scholar who becomes the next Bill Gates, becomes a highly successful entrepreneur, and then turns around and becomes one of the world's great philanthropists, that's a big success for us. So we need to think there, there's a life change. And, and I still remember many years ago, Bill said to me, I asked him when he was going to start doing more in, in, in philanthropy. And he said, I'm too busy running Microsoft. But when I have more time, that's what I'll do. And the amount that he's mastered in terms of global health and disease prevention and things like that, he, he's not an amateur in it. He's really dived into it deeply. And, you look at the work that the Gates Foundation is doing, it's transformative. So I'm happy with people going through these phases in their life where they do focus on different things. Just remember in the end, you want to look back on your life and say, did I leave the world a better place or not? Uh, one other question from the audience talks a little bit. We've talked a lot about the technology side of both universities and of industry. Um, talks about the humanities. What is the study of history and other humanities? What role does it play in informing leadership? So, if you look at my, if you look at the set of books I have uh, that I list in the in the book about things that have shaped me, you'll see they're almost all history, biography, things like that. Um, 
I think it's vitally important. I mean, we live in human society. We make decisions that are human. We need to understand the lessons that we learn from that. And I think the humanities are the thing that give you that grounding. Um, when you start out in your career, technical skills are really important. When you move into a leadership position, lots of other people skills, we sometimes call them soft skills, but that's actually a misnomer because they're not soft. They're important. How do you speak in public? How do you deal with people? How do you deliver a bad message to somebody in a way that's as humane and as kind as possible? Because the, one of the things that happens to leaders, you inevitably are saying no to people or telling people they're not living up to what you expect. If all you do is pile up enemies along the way and each one of those persons you give a bad message to becomes a sworn enemy, you're not going to last very long. So you've got to think about how do you convince people um, who may not agree with the decision that it's a rational decision and they need to be, continue to be an important part of the organization. Uh, our final audience question is, what has been the most challenging moment in life and how did you overcome it? Well, prob probably the most challenging um, moment for me um, my mother passed away when I was a freshman in college. Um, she, uh, and we had a family of six kids. Um, I, was, I was in my freshman year and she, um, she, she would write me letters and send me care packages. And then I got a letter from her that said, well, I'm having trouble with my vision and I can't write. And I think, well, well you know, she says, nothing's wrong, you know, keep working in college, don't. Um, and then I got a call from my father, maybe a month or later into the semester, and he said, you need to come home right away. And I went home right away, and um, I, I got home, and that night she passed away. And I was very close to my mother. My father, um, my father was an aerospace engineer in the 50s after Sputnik and the 60s. Um, and that was a time when aerospace engineers worked graveyard shifts. So he was often working at night. Uh, and m my mother is the one who put joy of reading in my life. So that was a really hard moment for me. It was re and it was really hard in my family, too. I mean, it really, it really uh, added a lot of tension and a lot of, di a lot of challenges in the, in the family. Um, the thing that overcame it, really, that helped me get through it, was the rest of my family. My, my mother's mother came and lived with us for a while and sort of became the surrogate mother um, for the family. Um, I had just met a uh, young lady who um, had become my girlfriend the year before, who is now my wife of uh, 44 years. Um, <laughs> And so that was a really important support, personal relationship. Um, but eventually, eventually got through it. it, it my, my academic record that semester, it's buried. It's buried. It was, you know, I got back and I just couldn't focus and I had a hard time recovering and things like that. So uh, really, really basically six months disappeared. I didn't get much done. And then I kind of re-resurrected re it uh, during the summer. and got my focus back and jumped back into school and got through it. And partly I got through it because I said, you know, what would my mother want me to do? She wanted me to, go, she didn't want to tell me even that she was seriously sick because she didn't want to disrupt my time at college and interfere with it. So that was a, that was a good reminder of what she would want me to do. Um, and it made a big difference in my life. It's an incredibly powerful story about personal relationships and mm -hmm. I think that's something you go into a little bit in the book about how important it is for leaders to have that kind of support network, people who are honest with them, people that they can confide in, people who really strengthen um, that leadership. Can you talk a little bit about your current, the personal relationships you have, yeah. your observations about them and how they have affected your leadership? And, and then also, you know, when you look at mentoring the next generation, yeah. You know, I think that's something that gets lost in the technological age. It, it, Are those personal relationships? It does get lost. It does get lost. And it can be a bit lonely at the top. I mean, it, uh, somebody once said to me, you know, once you become the, the top person in an organization, whether it's CEO or university president, you don't make a lot of new friends. 
because all of a sudden everybody there sees you in this power relationship and how does their relationship with you. Some, to some extent that's true. Most of my close friends were kind of predated that or have never been in the immediate circle. Now, that doesn't mean I don't have close relationship with the people who were direct reports to me. I absolutely have close relationships with them. And they were formed over time. And one of the things I really tried hard to focus on was I wanted everybody on my staff to be able to say, Hennessy, that's a really stupid idea. Don't <laughs> do that. Don't do that. In fact, the provost and I got to a point where we got really angry about something. We'd type out an email that we were going to send to somebody else in the university, and I'd send it to the provost. And he'd say, you're absolutely right, but do not send that email. <laughs> and he was right. And you know, having that reinforcement, having that, but having somebody will come in and say, you know, this isn't a good idea. You're about to make a mistake. And you need, you need, you need people who are reporting you who, are, who feel comfortable doing that. So I never shot the messenger. Never, ever, ever shot the messenger. Because that's the way CEOs get isolated, leaders get isolated from the rest of their organization. I remember my freshman week at Stanford, there was this really powerful talk about allies versus adorers. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. you know, people who will tell you the truth and, and really reflect you know, what you want to, to actually affect in, in the world. I saved myself the privilege of the last question, okay. which it might be hard to synthesize because I, my, my guess is the book itself embodies the answer to the question. But what do you hope, mo most hope that aspiring leaders will learn from the book? Well, I, I hope that they'll, they'll learn that leadership journeys can be incredibly rewarding if you set out on them for the right reasons and the right set of goals, that, you know, I, I loved leading the university for 16 years. Now, people will tell you how hard it is, all the kinds of things. That, it was wonderful. It was a terrific experience, really rewarding, exciting. Um, so leadership in these organizations, whether it's leading a startup or a bigger company or, or leading a university, can be extremely rewarding, provided you know what your end goal is and how you're going to succeed and what's going to make you feel good about the job you've done. I, I, there's a story in the book of, we were at a baccalaureate ceremony for all the graduating undergraduates, and we had somebody speak, um, a, a person who was the head of the um, Harvard Chapel, and he looked out at this group of, so the front few rows, maybe there are, there's 10 rows of undergraduates sitting there. Most of them, this is the day before graduation, most of them had stayed up too late the night before having a party. So they're all kind of, you know, sitting there. And their parents are all behind them. And he says, when you get to be my age, what you're going to look back on your life is look at the people you've touched and the positive impact you've had on, and that's what's going to really matter. And I'm sitting there. And all the parents' heads are going like this. <laughs> I said, there's some wisdom that take that wisdom because that's going to help shape your life and help you lead a life that when you get to be my age, you'll be a lot happier that you made those decisions. Thank you. Well, Marissa, this has been an amazing, an amazing conversation. And I just wanted to say, um, I know you don't need necessarily more praise, but as someone who's been touched in so many different ways by your efforts from the technology industry to Stanford to, to Google, um, I just want to say thank you so much for all that you've done for me personally, for all, all the different institutions that you've touched. I hope that you feel really good about those contributions. Oh, we feel good, and we feel very proud of people like Marissa. <laughs> <laughs>